Well, thank you very much, uh, Ben. It's a um, pleasure to welcome you to our virtual conference. <laughs> Um, and to this 100th anniversary series. Um, of course, Birkbeck did join the University of London in 1920, um, a not uncontroversial process. Um, various colleges opposed it vigorously. Um, Kings indicated that perhaps Birkbeck could teach preliminary classes and that its graduates could go, then go on to study at a proper um, college. But my predecessor, Professor Armitage Smith, fought long and hard and he got Birkbeck admitted to the university. And we've spent this year celebrating that event. Of course, it's been a rather strange year. We managed to get in four of the five lectures, um, one by each of the different schools um, before the lockdown. And we now have the privilege of hearing um, the fifth one, which we've been anticipating since then. Um, we had a visit from Her Royal Highness Princess Anne, the Chancellor, just before the lockdown. And indeed, during the lockdown, Birkbeck and the University of London have announced a new partnership to launch 15 online master's courses and around 50 short courses by distance learning um, responding to the issues of the pandemic, but basically linking Birkbeck's expertise um, with that of the University of London. So I think it's a great pleasure um, that we're culminating this um, in this um, event with Jean Seaton. Um, Jean is someone who has had all sorts of connections with Birkbeck and of course her late um, and much mourned husband, Professor Ben Pimlot, was in the politics department for many years at Birkbeck before he went on um, to greater things as warden um, of Goldsmiths. And of course, there can't be many people like Jean who had um, her husband's um, book on Queen Elizabeth dedicated to her, but then subsequently wrote a scholarly afterword to it. So I think the combination of those two is probably rather unique um, in this field. Um, Jean, of course, is Professor of Media History at the University of Westminster and has a distinguished record. Um, her splendid book on pinkos and traitors um, in the history of the BBC um, has been much discussed and lots of positive um, comments and we're delighted that she's with us and I think particularly delighted that she's going to speak um, around the very topical issue of disinformation and of course around um, the BBC that she knows so much about. So it's a very great delight um, made even greater by the anticipation of the number of months that it's taken um, to welcome Jean to our virtual Birkbeck and to invite her to give this centenary lecture. So Professor Jean Seaton. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Lutchman, uh, Birkbeck is deeply, deeply in my heart, is deeply in my children's heart for various reasons. And I think it's one of the most spectacular jewels in the way in which education develops in Britain and needs to be treasured and loved. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for this invitation. So I'm going to start. I'm going to start. But my the lecture I would have given and the lecture I am giving are rather different. The world has changed. Um, uh, and I want to reflect some of that. So off I go. The BBC was set up in 1923 to educate and entertain. It came from, to inform, educate and entertain. It came from the same impetus actually as Birkbeck, self-improvement, rational science for the many, understanding and greater knowledge as something that added to lives. But it was really set up at the dawn of a spectacular new way of communicating because of a panicked anxiety that the final tranche of enfranchised voters might vote not according to their material interests or ideals, uh, but because the new means of broadcasting will be so invasive and so persuasive that they, that they might have their views bent and brought behind their backs by big business in the commercial interests of business that their views might be falsely informed by foreign or indeed domestic ideologues. It wasn't very long after the Russian Revolution this was set up. And that they would be influenced by propaganda. Or that finally, that the role of the press in World War I, which also felt very close, had been so suspect that they would distrust government and they would distrust the media. These all feel rather prescient anxieties to me. And they formed the BBC. The BBC was set up to make sure that every British citizen would have access to the best, that there would be something for everyone. Broadcasting should be the expression of a new and better relationship between people, John Reith, the first Director General said. The BBC was to bring information to the masses on an equal basis so that individuals would be in a position to make up their own minds on matters of vital moment. 
It was there to make people's lives richer, their choices more intelligent, more informed, and to make society function more equally and better. But the BBC's always, that sounds very sort of glum, but the BBC has always also been there for daftness, for fun, for distraction when things are worrying, for glamour, for Morecambe and Wise and Fleabag, for putting its finger on the moment and coming up with something extraordinary. Universality that everybody pays so that everybody gets something and everybody pays so that everybody else gets something is the key to the BBC's role. It's the constitutional pillar it lives on and it needs refiguring and I might come back to that. But tonight I want you, I want to ask you to put aside the usually engrossing and perpetual argument about how the BBC delivers. I could argue with you about news values and reporting now. What do you throw a show at the BBC uh, throw a show shoe at the BBC over? What's wrong with the archers? Why the discussions of uh, statues in public faces wasn't properly chaired? Why Mrs. America was so great? The words of Royal Britannia and whether the BBC was biased against or for Brexit and whether it misled Princess Diana. I personally feel incandescent about what's happening to the reporting teams as we speak in Northern Ireland. And I felt that the Beethoven Undiscovered series was just genius. But I don't want to talk about that now. This is all reformable. It's all sortable. I want you as alumni of Birkbeck and this wonderful politics and social sciences department, really important departments, I want you to cast your eyes up, up the political and constitutional system. In the face of the total destabilisation and information and understanding and, the, and indeed our constitutional system um, by a new way of the deep, sorry, I want you to cast your eyes up the political, political and constitutional system in the face of the total destabilisation of information and understanding that's influencing so many of our systems and to consider also the nature of the opportunities that the BBC offers both domestically and internationally and the extraordinary attacks it's been under and continues to be so. Ben Worthy is the man you really want to go to uh, about information. Birkbeck's so, politics is so prescient, it's got the right person for the right moment in place. So what is the form of this attack? A blog by Dominic Cummings in 2004 said, there are three structural things that, are, that the right needs to happen in terms of communication. One, the undermining of the BBC's credibility. Two, the creation of a Fox News equivalent, talk radio shows, bloggers, etc., to shift the centre of gravity to the right. Three, the end of the ban on TV political advertising. Paddy Barwise and Peter York have just published a book, which, uh, which is called The Attack on the BBC, which goes into some of the deep roots in a quite peculiar right wing of some of these ideas, both in America and here. Government ministers, he went on to suggest, should avoid peer appearing on BBC Radio 4's Today programme, or indeed, if preferably, on the BBC at all. As you can see, most of these things have come to pass. Though with COVID, ministers scampered back to the Today programme. The BBC, it turned out, was too important to miss in the middle of a war. Added to the long run hostility to the BBC and the toxicity of the perhaps deliberately divided nation, there was the new politics of the internet age. It was off the petty dictator's toolkit that this set of ideals for the BBC and our information world uh, were garnered. And they've been jolly effective. They've on the whole won and they were given the added flair of social media and mobilization. The first thing you do is turn institutions into enemies of the people. I'm sure you remember the Daily Mail headline about the judges. I don't think I'm the only person that was deeply chilled by that actually. Then you whip up resentment and popular feelings. Mobs are frightening when they come after you. Politicians find mobs frightening, institutions find mobs frightening. That's why we have so far something called re representative democracy. It's about dealing with mobs in part. All of this popular power gives you the power to chill, cut, diminish, terrify, and, and basically reduce institutional independence. You bend them and you hollow them out 
and then they collapse from the inside because they are no longer beside the people and the causes that they need to be beside. Of course, the BBC has many long term enemies. The press. The BBC is a competitor on the platforms they want to compete on. One way to attack it is ideologically. Anyway, the BBC makes very good, interesting front page news. Uh, you might want to go to Nick Jones' book or my own book on Power Without Responsibility to look at the way in which a triangulation of media outlets is, is the current more modern way forward. You make your money with one, you push elite opinion with the other and you gather a pop popular with another. But in a way, this is all irrelevant because the future is all on the internet. Secondly, the BBC is, is frankly regulated to help foreign competitors. This is really odd. Ofcom balance, and I want to come back to Oliphant, Oliphants, um, balances the interests of the British public and those of the corporation, mainly for US owned competitors. An extreme example of, non of a non tariff barrier that systematically disadvantages a significant domestic player. Perhaps when we take back control next January and make Britain great again, we can remedy this egregious this egregious accident. Then there's the left and the right who have completely agreed that the mainstream media are the problem. I'd like to come back to that later. Both Navarra on the left and the Mail on the right think that there is something like the, ma the mainstream media and uh, 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 they're wrong and they should be abolished. In many ways, these arguments have won, won and won. And the fight back has been various, but not very successful. Let me take you back to February 2020, when I might have been about to give my lecture before. The government, safe in its majority, has declared war on the BBC. It has launched a bogus, and if you look at the letters, the words in it, really bogus, uh, public consultation on the decriminalisation of the licence fee. It has said it will end the licence fee just out of the blue uh, and not reinvent it. Like, there are problems with the licence fee, but that is now it doesn't. Government ministers refuse to be interrogated on the BBC. Over a weekend, an amazing public rising up occurs, um, which is called defund the BBC. It apparently bubbles up. It's very popular. But as my colleagues, Professor Stephen Barnett and Professor Doug Specht have shown in a wonderful weekend of work, it, it wasn't a bubbling up. It was set going by a set of very clear political ideologues on the right um, with a very clear objective. It's nothing to do with the public, the, pu the, the public to join it. Uh, and then in addition to that, you've got devolution. Scottish and Welsh independence and Brexit strains on the union, Northern Ireland being a real problem. Um, these all these all make fantastic strains on the BBC, and I could also come back to that. How has the BBC been attacked? The BBC's funding, the first thing to look at is always funding. Follow the money. The BBC has had its funding slashed already. Research by the voice of the viewer and listener this year, earlier this year in March, shows that the BBC's revenues are down 30% on the funding they had in 2010. Or as Barwise and York show, if you look at the current increase in production and distribution costs, which have spiralled, the BBC has lost 43% of its current expenditure. Or you might like to consider the Seton measure of the licence fee. I measure the licence fee historically in pints of beer. In 1923, one licence fee, which got you a bit of radio sometimes, bought you, uh, cost 60 pints of beer. In 1965, one colour licence, which got you two stations and two radio stations, cost you 79, nearly 80 pints of beer. In 2020, one licence fee is equal about 39 pints of beer, roughly half of what it was a century ago for the most extraordinary panel play of services. Weirdly, up to three years ago, the usual argument against the BBC, and I was listening to it in a, 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 on the radio this afternoon, um, was that it was too big, that it crowded out competition, that you needed plurality. Now with Netflix and Facebook, where the BBC faces some of the, literally the biggest companies the world has ever seen, um, the argument has switched amongst BBC opponents. It's now apparently too small and therefore hopeless, but we should have plurality. And more to come. There is more cuts going on as we speak. 
yet the BBC is one of the last reporting forces standing in the world. It's a miracle that it's uh, performing as it does, but this is ridiculous. If you want simply to project BBC UK values at home and abroad, this is the instrument and it's built for now. The second sort of real area of scrutiny and cut and attack is basically public appointments. Who the BBC gets, so I'm now going deep into the plumbing. Uh, uh, and I'm a, a, in, in, in this one aspect, I'm a plumbing expert. So who the BBC gets as a chairman has always mattered a great deal. The BBC chairman and director general working together and not always agreeing, doesn't matter what parties they come from, can reshape the BBC in ways that take it forward in great leaps. And they have done in the past. But you put a spoiler in there and the BBC drowns, I'm sure, the master, the VC of but that will tell you a uh, 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 CEO and his board at, at, at loggerheads loses momentum. The BBC is not a state broadcaster. Trust in the integrity of its output depends on it being seen as a completely independent from government or pol politician. Consequently, its content is regulated, not by politicians, but by Ofcom. It is Ofcom's regulation, I've just been nasty about it, that despite the collapse in commercial broadcasters' advertising, has made Sky a great news channel. Sky, as you may remember, is owned by the same company that owns Fox in America. But the regulation has made Sky a genuine contribution. Sky News, perhaps a fig leaf on the front of Sky, but don't like that, a genuine contribution to newsworthiness. So the chair of the BBC really matters. I, de I, I, I've, I really, 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 in a sense, want the best chair. I, I'm not actually very interested in in their politics and uh, because they should be leaving their politics at the door as they walk into the BBC but the anxiety is that they can't so if you look at the way in which uh the chairman uh is 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 being appointed now um and the chairman of Ofcom and, and that goes on down the public system then we ought to be seriously worried so how have they done it well you make the process the enemy and you appoint by leak so Charles Moore and Paul Dacre, Charles Moore now said he really doesn't want it, but were very serious candidates and were, I believe, uh, effectively appointed. This is an issue for all public appointments. Dido Harding has had three jobs. She's accountable to nobody and she was never in any public process. If you make the process the enemy and bounce it by leaks, um, then it chills other people from entering. They don't want to go in for it. And it, it gets rid of the proper competitive field we know. Secondly, you appoint cronies irrespective of their knowledge. I, I, my case, you know, you, that, 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 that is the petty dictator's toolkit. What, it's very difficult to know what can be done about the new architecture of public life, where it's taken for granted that current public, vacant public roles in broadcasting, chair of the BBC, head of Ofcom, look out the later, will need to be filled by people who are not merely conservative. That's fine. Most chairs of the BBC have been conservative. I don't care about that. But come only from that narrow faction that are sympathetic to the particular strand of conservatism now in power, power or members of the court around the prime minister. After a decade in power, this narrows the pool of talent to a microscopic puddle. Then you interfere in the process. The, uh, the process actually allows a great deal of government discussion. If you look at DCMS, it's got a very, very particular process around the appointment of the BBC. Of course, the government needs to be involved. It doesn't want a chair that it doesn't like, but this is a completely different thing. So you interfere in the process. Perhaps then you pack the BBC board. There are seven retirements coming up in the next four and a half months on the BBC board. Lots of room to be packed. Then perhaps at the moment, our public appointments commissioner the redoubtable, robust Peter Riddell, uh, a man of tremendous urbanity and integrity who knows what he's doing. And if you really want to make your hair stand on end, go and look at his evidence uh, to the Public Appointments Committee, which is really on the Peter Riddell scale. It's nuclear. Um, he's already had his job reduced. Perhaps you narrow his job further. Perhaps you replace him by somebody who's more compliant. He's going to retire in January. Perhaps you get rid of the role because nobody would know, notice at the moment it looks bureaucratic. 
Then there's the Commons DCMS Select Committee. You nobble the chair. Damien Collins was a Conservative who was previously the chair, who was a Brexiter. He stands for uh, Dover. Uh, but anybody that had been around the media and media policy for some, some time had a huge respect for him and indeed his, his special advisors who actually knew something. This is not true of all special advisors. He, he didn't get reappointed as chair of the DCMS Collective Committee. The DCMS Permanent Secretary. Hmm. The current Permanent Secretary of the DCMS is a hugely able uh, uh, woman. However, uh, Permanent Secretaries have had a mixed bag. And just, just today, Jonathan Evans uh, uh, you know, asked that we should go back and see what's happening to some of the reports that are supposed to be looking at the relationship between permanent secretaries and, and ministers. So those are all sort of areas of, of, of anxiety and you should watch them because in any of those cracks, the BBC can be diminished, cut and go. But what in this new world of information, what role does the BBC play in this new role of, in this new world of information and how can the BBC affect that? I want to talk a bit about information engineering, but Ben's the expert, really. Huge shift in how uh, information is accumulated and moved around the nation, national and international political system are reshaping political realities. Of course, more data and more information can transform medicine, transform understanding. But like any media, <laughs> it's not all good. They're, in a sense, these things are neutral. They can be used in good ways and in bad ways. The ways in which algorithms drive people to uh, to provide for commercial gain more of what people already like is deeply potentially damaging to our political system. But it affects what's happening to information affects your health as well. Covid has produced a pandemic of mis and disinformation. It spread originally lethally fast when it might. I'm sorry, it's the cat who's getting in the way. I'm really sorry. The cat is now. <laughs> <laughs> removed. Uh, it's spread le lethally fast when it might have been contained because of an information failure. Handling the crisis has been set by models built on insufficient data, confused public health messaging and the success of conspiracy theories which undermine the understanding and dangerously impede protection and recovery. Sadly, many governments, especially our own, have relied on a search and fudge and, and dodge. This government's unwillingness to share complete information and to hold costively onto a centralised plan left a gap, left a very big gap for misinformation and suspicion to flood into its place. COVID-19 has posed the problem and indeed the opportunity of communicating intelligently about uncertainty. And uncertainty is the politics department's big, the thing it's always trying to look at. Um, but instead of involving the public, as several cabinet secretaries asked, in a discussion, an intelligent discussion of risk, it went on saying it knew best when it evidently didn't. Information is not some mysterious thing that or an evidence that people make policies over there. It's, it's, it's something much more profound and its role in our lives has changed. So the virus has revealed and accelerated an information crisis as well as a health one. And you only have to look at the American election to see something disturbing. I'm not saying that how people voted didn't reflect genuine unfairnesses and genuine anxieties. I am not saying that people are dupes. I am saying the blindingly obvious that true, hard work, hard won, difficult to accumulate, testable, uncertain uh, information that is as accurate, as understandable, and as shared really matters. But that is perhaps being driven out by bad. Disinformation, the deliberate spreading of false information, is amplified by misinformation, the accidental or indeed sincere re-spreading of disinformation. But bad information affects your health as well. NHS Digital um, does a routine uh, investigation into uh, people's attitudes, parents' attitude, attitudes towards vaccinating their children. And there has, over the last decade, been a serious and steady erosion of trust in vaccination, which, of course, leave all of our grandchildren exposed 
uh, to the, the possibility. Uh, measles, we've, we've come off measles, is, we're, not, we're not safe of measles anymore. And measles makes you blind. Um, this long-term anti-vaccination has accelerated under COVID so that we might, uh, and just as we might have a vaccination that would, for COVID, that might begin to make uh, real life possible again, so that I could be in the room and read you and understand what you're interested in, not just see you as faces on Zoom. Um, is 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 we know that a third of the French public think COVID vaccinations are likely to be unsafe, and a quarter of the UK pop population, as of two days ago, um, would not take the COVID vaccination and would not give it to their children. This is really alarming, but it's related to another concern that is bigger and that the BBC plays a role in. General Sir Nick Carter, Chief of Defence Staff, in a, in a speech at Rusey a couple of, probably last week actually, said, so this is you know, the Chief of the Soldiers, who in fact Hugh Edwards on the BBC failed to mention the name of, um, didn't get his name right, at the Remembrance Day service today, very bad BBC. The COVID, this is what Nick Carter said, the COVID crisis has highlighted how the use of propaganda, data misuse, disinformation and strategic influence is presenting complex and rapidly evolving challenges for researchers, civil society and policymakers. And our autocratic rivals have utilised these techniques most effectively. The Australian Strategic Policy Institute is tracking how a range of actors are manipulating the information environment to exploit the COVID-19 crisis for strategic gain, including pro-Russian vaccine politics, whose disinformation narratives designed to permeate anti-vaccination social media groups. Russia has used cyber and information attacks to destabilize our society. This is not Carol Cadwallader. <laughs> this is the chief of the defense staff. He goes on to say, the answer to this has to be trusted and reliable information. We must chart a direction of travel from an industrial age of platforms to an information age of systems in all venues. He called for a new integrated approach to conflict. We're actually, he implied, at war, and information is the key, is the key machinery of it, and we're losing it. In what way might the BBC be an answer? I'm certainly not saying that the BBC is an instrument of state power, but pointing out that the threat that the BBC can mitigate on to our collective interests and as a bearer of democratic values is really important to our way of life. The BBC has trust and world recognition. It could fit the modern world better, it doesn't at the moment, if it's been allowed to. There is space for public service, impartial import, uh, reporting and information. Indeed, there's an international market gap that the BBC could help to fill in a way that would be good for us, but also good for the world. Despite Netflix and all of those, uh, uh, those very big players, huge, Facebook, um, there is an international opportunity, and Tim Davis has identified it, for an impartial, generous and rigorously creative BBC that, that could, play, could play a bigger part. Impartiality is a BBC unique world brand, and it could play into the Netflix world. And by golly, as in our diminished state, couldn't we use it too? So the, let's just have a brief look at the BBC's issues of BBC's reach and trust. Despite what the Daily Mail tells you, 91% of UK adults visit the BBC every week for 18 hours. 80% of under 35s use the BBC as their main source of news, though not on TV. Globally, the BBC attracts a mind-boggling 468 million people a week, and it's trusted by a very long way beyond the local media. Um, I run a foreign office project that works in India and Pakistan, and, and I can see the importance of clean information that the BBC gives in those markets. A Reuters digital news survey done in America in October 2020 showed that by a large margin, the BBC was trusted in America more than CNN, more than Fox, more than the Wall Street Journal, more than the New York Times, an extraordinary uh, 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 outcome. And during the election, 40% of Americans turn to the BBC more than once. That is a, that, that's reach and trust. I know these things can all be 
question, but let's just go on with it. Indeed, domestically, surveys consistently show that the BBC remains one of the things that makes us feel most proud to be British. British made creative con content, our imaginations, our, our, our thoughts and imaginations and ideas of what might be good or bad, uh, reimagined by the BBC in a variety of programme formats. Research has always shown that people value local content. If, unless you hold on to the BBC, there's going to be no British made content. And I could also tell you more about that. But the very interesting fit for purpose extra that there is, as it were, available now around the BBC, I think, is that information and impartiality are central, but it's also a maestro of feelings. It's, it, it's got the capacity to mould and shape and express our feelings in ways that are really important. Feelings are the kind of swampland of contemporary politics. Graham Wallace's absolutely foundry book, uh, which I'm sure you all read, I actually, I certainly did. Uh, managing feelings in politics is a very complicated business. BBC's good at managing feelings. Can I just suggest that you think of the difference between Strictly Con Dancing, where you laugh with the contestants, not at them, and say Love Island. There's something in that distinction which is really profound and important. Government policy has consistently, no doubt, unintentionally, got the strategic interests of the UK over media policy around the BBC disastrously long for the last 15 years. It stymied, for instance, an attempt to build the BBC's proposal to build a public service research engine with a public service algorithm in 2005. What a different world we would occupy if the government hadn't stopped it because it thought it was competitively bad. But in the new 21st century, can it be allowed to be as beside the British public where they consume things, how they consume things as it could be? We do need a reformed, and this is an outrageous thing to say, bigger BBC, putting information engineering and the public interest at the centre of a new vision for the UK. We're in the middle of an information war and we need policy based on the national interest, not narrow commercial competition. In the face of a real threat to the BBC, it is a, a, and a real threat to our way of lives, the BBC is a national and international tool that could be made fit for purpose. The combination of ex of expertise in assessing evidence and brilliance at helping us express, shape and master sentiment makes it uniquely placed in the contemporary communica communicative world. Global Britain already has global BBC. It just needs to let its power and creativity be unleashed in ways that fit the new way. I was, I was very uh, impressed. So John Major made a wonderful speech, which I recommend to you all uh, two days ago. And in it, he said, in a wonderful John Major sort of way, didn't look a, a, a moment older than he had, done, had done when he was prime minister. Major said, I do, I do find it surprising that in the midst of a COVID crisis, the government appears to be fostering disputes with the judiciary, where all government should tread carefully, that it's fostering disputes with the civil service, upon whose help the government depends and fostering disputes with the BBC, still the most respected broadcaster on the planet. So that's what I wanted to say. And I, I think the final thing I wanted to say is one of the things that's a great lacuna in our public life. You can complain about the BBC to the BBC. You can complain about the BBC to Ofcom. You can complain about the BBC up and uphill and down down. You can find complaints about the BBC express the newspapers. It's very difficult to find anywhere you can express support or anxiety about propriety around the BBC. So I think you're all going to have to write to your MPs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for that talk. It, 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 um, I think it really kind of symbolised the, the, the double attack that the BBC is really facing, which yeah. is the kind of very obvious direct political attack, as you talk about making the process the money, attacking the process, attacking um, the money itself, but also this kind of indirect attack of, of where the BBC finds its place in the world and the changing context of information. And it's this kind of very obvious attack 
in this rather more subtle attack, the direct and the indirect, um, I think, which poses uh, so many questions. And I thought what you said about feelings there, um, uh, the issue of trust, which is absolutely crucial, um, really, really important. And, and this sense that the sort of, and this seems to be the most 2020 political thing I can say, uh, the sense that the uh, sort of checks and balances have been undermined and the things that are supposed to keep it stable um, are being taken away. OK, um, so just to remind everybody who joined in, this is, uh, my name is Ben Worthy. I'm the director of the Centre for British Political Life. If you're back and I'm speaking with Professor Jean Seaton about the BBC. Um, and we've had lots of questions come through on the chat. So I'm going to just reserve myself one question for you as Chair's prerogative. Um, it's been a very long week in politics. Um, and I think, as we were saying earlier, it's kind of hard to get used to good news um, in some senses. And uh, I wanted to maybe ask you to paint a picture of what a good and a bad scenario for the BBC would look like, say, in five years time and yeah. how both a good and a bad scenario would would come about. Well, the bad scenario is very easy. You get a, you know, I've, I've painted the picture of the cuts that have existed. The licence fee, I can't, I can't, the licence fee um, doesn't quite fit, it doesn't fit the modern world because people don't watch telly, but, but they do consume information in many different ways. I, I, I'm, it's not my job to come up with an alternative which is universalistic, but a, a bad BBC will go on having huge cuts, vast cuts, both locally, local really worries me. The BBC always leans on the crutch of local when there's a crisis, but it also cuts local. So I'm really, really worried about the, when I say I'm worried about the BBC in Northern Ireland, this is an enduring anxiety. The terrible cuts going through there at the most sensitive moment in the most sensitive place in the union. So you, you, go, on, you go on cutting the funding so it can't do what it should do. Um, you cut the funding so it can't make the drama, for instance, in big enough blocks to sell internationally. The Salisbury, the Shreepal poisonings, which is a very interesting example. There are only three of them. If they could have made 12, they could have sold it internationally. That was a really good example of drama, real life drama, very innovatively taking apart the story, the human story of the Shreepal poisonings, but in, but also telling you what was going on in the world, you know, people were being poisoned. So you cut the financing, you put tanks of, of narrow 20th century dimensions all around it. That's my, my worry is that you get chairman and um, people of Ofcom who really don't understand this modern world. They really need to leap a generation. So you hedge it around with more regulation you wish on about um, plurality, so you 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 do you you have more competing things which you somehow let through. You cut down the BBC. You undermine it the whole time by arguments about about trust, about whether it's ideologically true. You end up with a small national. Or, or, or the worst scenario is the people who believe in um, subscription, who all hate the BBC. <laughs> they all say they love it, but they actually hate it. Um, get that through because they, you know. So you end up with a small rump organisation which is not big enough to say boo to the government, and um, can't express our values all over the world, and looks like a Chinese or Russian state broadcaster, and doesn't deliver locally, and isn't where people's lives are. And you can do that very easily. I mean, they. They're doing quite well on doing that at the moment. Okay, a good BBC, and I can't, I can't technically answer this, but there are lots of bigger brains than me. Has some alternative to the license fee, which is universalistic, that makes people really pay something for something we all get, because that that is the constitutional prop for the BBC, uh, but that has to be at a distance from government even if that's a notional distance, because all of that notional, you know, gives it independence. Secondly, it's got a new director general. It has a real vision for, and I think he has got a real vision for where you play impartiality, creative British content, actually into world markets. They, 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 you know, Attenborough already goes around, you know, half the world doesn't believe in evolution, but they like Attenborough. 
Um, uh, net, you know, Netflix is just like, this is all very good for British industry, by the way. The BBC is not a failure. That's the, you know, Netflix is just doing its, um, put all of its uh, wildlife programmes in Bristol to sit beside the BBC wildlife. It's very good for BBC, in, for national investment. Most of, most BBC staff are now out of London. There are lots of sort of lies around. So you could get a BBC which really does embody British values of, and these are all contested, fairness, um, impartiality, balance. These are all very difficult things. Um, and it rolls them out onto the world stage and it takes our values with it and our creative industries. And on the back of that, people remember where Britain is. I have to tell you that there are only two things that people in America know about Britain, one of one of which is the Queen and the other which is, is, is the BBC. And that's true over a lot of the world. So it's the most formidable piece of kit. So if you made it, if and you're going to have to let it go to do it. You don't, you have, it might make some mistakes, but you have to encourage it to be bold on all of our behalves. And in that sense, the World Service is one of the great gifts of Britain to the world. But of course, the, cut, the, the, the feedback in terms of what politics departments called soft power, but I don't really like to call soft power, but that's what it is, is huge. And the commercial benefit of that is enormous. So there are two easy scenar two scenarios. The second one's more difficult to get to. The good one's more difficult. The, the bad one's very easy to get to because you throw the BBC off the back of the sledge because there's a group in the Conservative Party who loathe and hate it, just like they loathe and hate lots of things. And you keep them off your back and you keep the Daily Mail off your back by doing it. So it's easy and comfortable to kill it. I was just going to actually um, pick a few questions out the chat that, that, that kind of run along this theme, if that's okay. Yep. So Dilwyn asks a very interesting question saying, has the requirement for balance had its day? And Dee has asked a kind of a similar question about this argument that the BBC has, partly because of this attack you talk about, been somehow cowed um, it isn't as courageous um, as it could be. And, and she asks, how can you make it a more kind of brave, incisive new br news broadcaster that is true to its Rethian roots? Can so I, really, has I, I, balance I, had it day and how do you make it braver? Yeah. Um, so, you know, impartiality, I'm just about to, to, to write something on the history of impartiality as much of that. Um, impartiality and balance are not perfect things. They're a bit like democracy. They're processes. You, you can't have it and go away with it and say, I've got, I'm, I'm being impartial. They're, they're always affected by mores. There's a big generational mores change going on, uh, which I think is very interesting. Um, so one set of the population thinks one set of things about you know sexuality and another set of the population doesn't so how do you balance those views the the proper way so so it's always in evolution it's always challenged if you think it's challenged now in a way during the troubles in northern ireland it was unbelievably challenged every day and the bbc in belfast got blown up 159 times to prove it you know it, you know and and it was it brought into terrible tension with governments who also tried to sort northern ireland i have some sympathy both sides so my first answer is these things are never perfect they they need reimagining the whole time tim davy takes that the new director general takes that very seriously he said uh, very interestingly, for an uxorious man, he said we it, we must review renew our vows on impartiality, and he straight away stopped some BBC people tweeting. So I think that balance and impartiality have not had their day. Balance is just a tool of impartiality, but the BBC is there. It's very simple. Um, if more people believe that the world is flat than they used to be. That's a very interesting topic and the BBC should certainly give them a voice because they'll get very annoyed if they don't hear themselves and feel repressed. Um, and it should also interrogate why there are more of them and why they believe it more. But it should never ever under any circumstances leave listeners, and it should always treat them politely, in any doubt that the world, that science shows you that the world is round, not flat. I, mean, I, can, I can do it, but it, every day that's a topical issue. So balance, I don't think is over. And I worry about the general view of in 
So we could discuss that, that. Bravery and news values is something else. But I've, in a sense, partly talked about the structure that underpins bravery. Um, and in my experience, the BBC is a like all of these places, journalists, non-journalists, I think, fail often to understand the bravery of being a journalist, not just going somewhere, but sticking with a story, standing up for a story, it being true, the curiosity of it. So I think bravery does come ultimately from the institutional proprieties. I'm not totally miserable about all of these things, but I think we should be alarmed. I think that it, I th I personally think news does need re reimagining. What I mostly want is more journalists. I mean, the BBC is cutting journalists. The one thing you need to make really good news is not, as people think, somebody just sitting on a computer. It's actually journalists pursuing stories. I don't think it did lose bravery during COVID. Um, the government denounced a fantastic panorama that um, counted the number of PPE. And the government the government treated the BBC if it was a traitor in just showing out that, you know, a pair of gloves was not two items of PPE, but <laughs> was being counted as two. You know, so I think at times it's, I can look back and see, it, it, you know, it's, it's the ministers hasn't made a big fuss about ministers flooding back into the Today studio. You know, it's not, it's not said... Yabu sucks. It's just taking them in, but because they need it. So, you know, it needs great editors, great leadership, but above all, it needs great journalists and creative people. But would you be brave? I mean, bravery is a very, it's funny, I was just um, thinking about Charles Wheeler, because next week we've got the Charles Wheeler lecture at work. And Charles Wheeler was an enormously conscient, he was a man full of integrity. And resigned from the BBC over um, over something, but he was he was a reporter right the way through from the Cold War through Kennedy and everything. He was a very he was like he was like rock. He was he was a man whose reporting was essential to him, and he exercised daily bravery in pursuing what he thought and often was right was the right voices and the right stories. Maybe I could uh, just pick up on another question from the chat from from Alan Lodge and, and switch from the political attack to the issue that, that you mentioned at the beginning about um, resources. Yeah. And I think this is a question about political st sustainability. How long do you think the BBC can continue to be resourced in the way that it is? And maybe the hidden question in there is, uh, do you think that the, the licence fee in its current form will survive this onslaught? I mean, it, it, I, th I thought in a way, um, you know, I don't, I, it, in one sense, I spend more of my time thinking about this than is entirely sensible. I think I think about it more than I think about supper, probably. Um, but, but in a way, I also don't quite have the answer to this. I don't think that the licence fee, as it's currently configured, works because people don't, take their telly, which they take a lot of. During COVID, telly and radio listening went absolutely, BBC watching and listening went absolutely through the sky. Um, they don't take it uh, through a machine called a television. So it's a kind of, it's become unhinged. What I think, but I can talk about the principles and that the, the absolutely key principle is that whatever funding mechanism, somebody with goodwill and generosity and cleverer, cleverer than me can come up with, it has to be in some sense universal because it's the universality that makes the BBC part of the unwritten constitution of Britain because it has access to data about citizens that nobody else has. It knows what citizens like when they get up in the morning. It knows whether they, what age group likes Fleabag. I mean, I thought Fleabag was amazing. Um, it, so it has data about all of us and it has to serve all of us, whether we're poor, whether we don't buy things, whether we're, you know, we're in communities that, and it may not do this perfectly. So that universality. So I don't have a technical answer, but I think I know a man in the BBC called Bill Thompson, who's clearly thinking about it. Maybe I can I can jump in there with a with another question then um, from Sam Ashenden. 
uh, and she asked, you talked there about universality, and you also said that the BBC needs to fit the modern world better. So she asked um, probably the central question, really, which is what is the role of the BBC in this new world of social media? And um, she, she wondered whether, now that we're talking kind of universality and, and key parts of the British Constitution, um, whether the fate of the BBC um, could be the same as the kind of fate of, of, of what we used to think of as the old fashioned welfare state. Well, two, two questions. I think the BBC has an enormous audience, an enormous reach. It's part of everybody's lives. Um, people still mark their lives through the programmes they watched, what, what children still do that. Um, but that's a still argument. I would like it to be... Um, bigger and bolder than that actually um but i don't think you should look back and be nostalgic i think you have to unleash the bbc which you know if i look at the innovations that the bbc has proposed after the over the last 15 years that the government and its regulators have turned down we will be in a different information environment i just go back to that public service search engine i don't know what ben thinks but supposing at the beginning of search engines now everybody uses google they believe what they read on it that there was a i took out a uh a, a, a ref a whole a whole paragraph on that you know when people use google they think it's sending them to good stuff no it's not it's sending them to stuff <laughs> um so public service algorithm now people are there's a lot of money out there to find a public service algorithm but the bbc was ahead of the game on that but was stopped it you know, the BBC was has made markets continually in the territory of information. If you look at the iPlayer, which I don't know if I think that's the best name for it. But anyway, the thing that you get hold of the archive on, the BBC made the world's markets for iPlayers. This is technological innovation around the archive at, at an extraordinary sense. So my senses, um, John Burt's extraordinary great decision to give the BBC away on all platforms when everybody said you shouldn't because you know where would it go hugely inspired uh, and he had a view about what you would do about that so I am uh, I think that the BBC in the past has been really good at information engineering uh, in the public interest so why don't I I, I have no why not give it a try would be, we certainly could do with some big public interest players in the information organization that we're facing. So the BBC is one of the world's best opportunities to start to do something about that. And it's ours. It has British values in it. You know, it speaks for us. Um, I, you know, it's a future set of industries. So if I look back, it's a different history from the one you're saying. I wouldn't say still. I'd say the BBC has this extraordinary history of entrepreneurial and industrial innovation around information. I imagine it will have if we let it go in the future. That's one thing. What was the other question, Sam? I can't remember what the other question was. It, the, the question was about meeting the, the kind of um, social media. Um, yeah. Okay. Meeting well, the world so of social media. Well... I mean, I, you know, I've written, I'm not an expert like Ben, um, and you can see the, you can, you know, but I've written a couple of things on the way in which everything has changed. I mean, it's the, the essence, in a way, of social media is that um, you, 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 you believe where it's coming from because it comes from somebody you trust, but somebody you trust might be your mate or it might be a Russian bot, you know, um, or it might be a Russian bot to your mate. So, again, that's, that, that's just what it is. And if we look at what's happening in America, it's unrolling in, in America now, you know, uh, um, uh, Trump coming off Twitter and going to even more paranoid sites. Clint Watts, who's an American writer I'm very keen on, um, 
who did an extraordinary thing about the Russian interference in the 2016 election, um, he's just got a podcast out and he said, you know, right wing terrorism is a big threat. This information is a big threat. The biggest threat is ourselves. And by that, he really means the way in which we're communicating on social media. Again, I can't answer that. Ben might be able to. But getting clean, tasty challenge and information out there does work. And when things matter, what I always what I always say, I always say to my um, students who are very immersed in foreign theory and really don't believe that there's anything as like objectivity and they believe in subjectivity and, you know, and they think there's biases, everything is biased, so everything is biased, blah, blah. Um, I always turn the light on and off and I say, well, why do you think the light comes on? And they look a bit puzzled because I'm being a difficult old bag. And the answer, of course, is that lights come on because there is true information makes the light system work. And, and in a sense, the Enlightenment is a set of arguments for true information. So I can't answer that totally. But I do think using programmes that young people um, uh, relate to, looking at how you get into their worldviews. Young, pe young people on social media, people on social media are quite often quite oddly idealistic. I mean, it is like a kind of, you know, you want to be seen proudly in the community you're joining to, even if that, it, it's not a, it's oddly, it's not a, you know, it's not, it's not scurrilous. It's, it, it can be, it can be scurrilous in outcome, but it, it, it uses good, some good loyalties, oddly, things like loyalty and honour and things like that. So I think you, we just, we're at the beginning of experimenting how we might, uh, you know, start to grapple back the Enlightenment. And just to, to pick up on, on Sam's uh, question yeah. here, is this about, do you think, talking to one public or is this a recognition that the BBC has to address kind of multiple publics simultaneously yeah. as part of its future? Uh, both. Both. I mean, it's like everything. It's like everything. You have to do both. You know, there are great moments when it still brings us together and we should treasure it because that's quite important. So V Day, VJ Day, which I I had some reservations about, you know, uh, the, the Queen's speech during COVID at the end of the VE Day. Extraordinary. You know, half the world was watching a nonagenarian looking extremely elegant at the end of VJ Day. You know, it's extraordinary. Our own nonagenarian. Um, so there are these big moments when we know everybody turns to the BBC, you know, and they sometimes there's a coming together. There was actually rather a good poem by Simon Armitage in the um, Remembrance Day service, uh, and it was about the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior, which I think is a great universalistic piece of kit, actually, we, you know, we don't know how old he was, we don't know what whether he was a great, he was an officer or a man, we don't know where he came from, you know, we don't, we don't know how he died, we don't know who his family were. It's a wonderful piece of universalistic memorialising. And the poem said, you know, um, princesses in their white satin uh, shoes. Well, the next time a, a royal gets married, that you know, they leave their bouquets there. Those are, those are moments that definitely bring us together. And lots of people watching... Three Pal Poisonings brings you together. So it's got to get those moments, but it's but it's already serving, you know, it's serving Pakistani. It's, it's for instance, the Urdu audience. The Urdu audience is huge in across India and uh, Pakistan. I've been in the BBC when Indian MPs have berated the BBC for broadcasting into India in Urdu. And uh, because, you know, that's a the language of Pakistan, and um, the, the 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 lady from the BBC said, "Well, there are four million listeners, so we're serving them, and Urdu is their first language." And it was just a wonderful answer. Four million Urdu speakers can get the BBC, so uh, the, it already serves lots of audiences, and it's got to go on doing that better. If uh, maybe I could just. Uh... Just, just have the final question then. Um, we, you, you've mentioned the, the, the amazing events over the weekend, um, and uh, I can, I can, I can only feel a kind of wash of 
of relief over the weekend. I just had the, the, the comment from Churchill when uh, the United States entered the war in my head, which was, yes. uh, so we won after all. Um, can, I, can I mention something very particular and historical of me about that? So Churchill is having supper uh, uh, with the American ambassador uh, in, in the country and the butler brings the BBC radio in and they turn the nine o'clock news on and he hears over the radio that America's come in and they dance together. So the first way that particular piece of news reached both the American ambassador in Britain and Churchill. Sorry, it's because I love that moment. That's <laughs> anyway. wonderful. Um, I just wanted to... It was strange watching what happened in America because you saw this after a long four years of, of misinformation. There was a fascinating study showing that the key source of misinformation about the pandemic has been Donald Trump as president. And suddenly you saw the networks behave differently. You saw social media behave differently. You saw Twitter, who have been behaving differently for a little while. You saw Facebook behaving differently towards Donald Trump. Are there lessons in this kind of shift? Yeah in how the media treated this for the BBC and how it goes about doing things in the future, just as a, a kind of final thought. Uh, I, I think I said earlier, I was out on a walk in Islington and it was like, it was as if Arsenal had won a home game. You could tell by the way people were talking to each other and people were just saying Biden's in on, on that afternoon. So it was a very, and a great outpouring actually of affection a need for America, which I think in itself is quite interesting. My view of that was that that was all very good for the BBC and very good for something that has been much despised called the mainstream media. I think that they had probably um, got a joint strategy so they couldn't be picked off one by one by Trump. Do you mean they they because there was a very coherent, you know, we will listen to the primate to the president until he starts telling a lie and then we'll cut him off because it's egregious. So I saw that as a really interesting, and of course, as a really interesting moment in a fight back against dis and misinformation, leaving aside the problem, of course, that, you know, he has gone on uh, with this spectacle of, of, of disputing and contesting and, you know, uh, it, so we don't know how that will pay out. But as a moment, I saw that as a pro-BBC, properly informed, decisive action of some bravery, actually. Although you might say, you know, the New York Times has turned around its economic model under a Brit, Mark Thompson, that it's making money again. So uh, the president hasn't been all bad for the for the mainstream media, actually. But um, I, I certainly saw that as a sort of shift back to some sense of propriety and listening to other sides with one caveat. Uh, Fox News call for Biden. Uh, now, that, that's an extraordinary thing because Trump is the product of Fox News. All it meant really, presumably, was that Murdoch had decided to jump ship. <laughs> and Murdoch, you know, um, obviously Rupert will die, but the power of some of those organisations is is very large. Jean, it's been it's been fascinating speaking with you, and I, I know we, I could continue bombarding you with questions all evening. Um, I wondered if you could leave us with just um, just a recommendation. Um, I've got a lot to think about, and I wondered if you had any books or articles that you think we should definitely go and hunt down now to learn more about the BBC, more about these ideas of truth and information. Um, I think you can have up to two, if you like, two recommendations. <laughs> well, for three. I mean, just because it's, you know, this is not, I'd, I'd, just because you'd enjoy it and it's not very long, I'd recommend actually uh, uh, Human Voices. Ah, oh, God, I can't remember but the name of the novelist about the BBC during the Second World War. Oh, bloody hell. Sorry, the name is just gone. Anyway, I'll find it in a minute. I'd, I'd recommend for those of you with lots of stamina, Bernard, William on, Bernard, Bernard Williams on Truthfulness, which for a book written a long time ago, is just astonishingly clear and cautious and principled and wonderful um, about all of the issues around truthfulness and sincerity and information. It's a very wonderful book. So, I and, and I think I've sent you some 
things about the BBC now. There's there's some really I, I suppose I I would put in one more thing, which is look up the public account Peter Riddle's evidence to the Public Accounts Committee, because it will make your hair stand on end. Uh, uh, and, and those those levels of plumbing we've got to get into. It's so. a Penelope Fitzgerald, is that right? For Penel human voices, is that the oh, one? Penelope Fitzgerald is the human voices, just because it's a lovely novel. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I want to say a big thank you. Just before we end, I wondered if everybody in the audience wanted to either switch off their microphones a second and applaud or um, just send us an emoticon on the chat just to say a big thank you to, to, to Jean for speaking with us for, for so long and so intelligently. <laughs> I want to say a huge thank you um, for Jean for speaking with us. A big thank you to all the team at Birkbeck who organised it. And a huge thank you from Birkbeck for you doing this. You are welcome, Jean, to come and speak to Birkbeck at any time uh, that you like. This talk will be recorded, so anybody who was here or didn't get a chance to see it all, um, it will be sent out. Um, and there'll be a link there. There's also um, lots more events happening at Birkbeck. So uh, I'm director of the Centre for British uh, Political Life. There's all sorts of things happening there and across the university. So do please keep your eye out. But a really big thank you to Jean. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. Um, and please uh, stay in touch and look out for, for more events from Birkbeck.